Hi, I'm Dr. Paul Lewis Metzger and I'm the director of New Wine, New Wineskins. Welcome to New Wine Tastings, where every week we'll have an opportunity to engage people from diverse backgrounds, all in the attempt to build relational bridges through Jesus in contemporary culture. We are desirous of the opportunity to engage in deep and meaningful ways, and we're really thrilled and excited to have you with us. Hello, I'm Paul Lewis Metzger, the director of New Wine, New Wineskins, the Institute for Cultural Engagement. And I'm here today with my good friend, Pastor Mark Nicholas at Beaverton Foursquare Church. Welcome to New Wine Tastings, where we seek to build relational bridges through Jesus in our contemporary culture. Pastor Mark is the pastor of local and global outreach for Beaverton Foursquare Church. And we're going to talk today about his and others' work in addressing the coronavirus uh, pandemic, uh, both locally and globally. Mark, thanks so much for joining us today for New Wine Tastings. It's good to be here, Paul. Uh, Mark, uh, as we have uh, discussed in the past, uh, you wear many hats, uh, two of which are what I just discussed, and that is local and global outreach at Beaverton Foursquare Church. Um, presently, what are you doing in your local context? I saw you the other day on Facebook with surgical mask on and then you kind of took it off and you say hey we're here in the community you know, uh, let's let's work together in addressing this conflict and I was just really uh, struck and touched by that and just encouraged by the work you and others are doing right out of the gate in addressing uh, this pandemic even as it comes close to home so what are you doing locally in this regard at Beaverton Foursquare with other churches uh, civic authorities and the like well, Paul, it's fluid and it's changing, uh, but we're figuring it out daily. Um, we went online right away, as most churches have. Uh, we were fortunate to have already had that capability. Uh, we also offered our facilities to other churches that don't have recording capabilities so they could come and record their services. Uh, that worked really well the first week. The latest governor's order might have to make us reconsider how we're going to do that. But fortunately, quite a few took us up on that last week. We also offered that to the school district if they wanted to come and use any of that for any kind of a message or address that they wanted to make. Um, probably the biggest thing is we started a food drive and we've been delivering food to, to about 50 families who we know that are facing food scarcity. Um, we've also been online with not only the school district, but with some of the other churches in the area. Holy Trinity next door to us has a food closet. And actually today we're going to talk about whether or not we can expand the capability uh, of creating food boxes. Part of the reason we're doing that is the school called us and they said that they were limited in some way. They could serve food at the school, but they could not deliver it to the kids who had the, the greatest food scarcity also couldn't get to the school just because of distance. So uh, we started delivering lunches and then uh, realized that wasn't going to be a good long-term solution. So we started making food boxes, which we did last week. And some other things as well. We've offered our, our facilities to some organizations. The Red Cross um, is going to use part of our building for their blood drive since the school's closed. That's the location they do blood drives in. And the, uh, the blood supply is low. So they called us up and we said, yeah, you can use our facility. So we're trying to partner with other churches, with the city, with civic authorities, with um, people like the Red Cross, and trying to find those solutions we need right now in the midst of all this. I really appreciate uh, the work you've done over the years. Uh, for those who are uh, watching or listening, uh, Mark and I go way back, and uh, Mark has served as an advisor and New Wine, New Wineskins worked with me in the doctoral program in cross-cultural engagement. And I've gained a lot, learned a lot from Mark over the years. And one of the things I've appreciated so much about the work that he and others are doing there is that if someone's doing a good work, they come alongside. It's not like they have to create it and others have to come on board. If Trinity, uh, the Catholic Church next door is doing a phenomenal work, hey, how can we come alongside if that's okay, can we come alongside in, in just in support? Uh, waiting for the invitation uh, much of the time, not imposing, uh, even as a big church, but working alongside the schools as the school uh, asks for um, support. Um, other uh, non-Christian groups, I just, I appreciate the, the posture of coming alongside rather than imposing, because it's easy to do as a big church if one's not careful, even well-intentioned. One can come across as an imposition rather than 
uh, a positive addition. And I, I've appreciated that, uh, that posture and just the collaborative spirit. Um, you also work overseas, and uh, I've always been struck by your work, whether it's Papua New Guinea, uh, whether it's um, you know other parts of Asia. Of course, China uh, is an area that you go back to, uh, you know, a, a nation you go back to quite often, and have close connections there. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a bit about the work our Chinese friends or your Chinese friends are doing there, pastors, churches, and beyond? in terms of this global pandemic of the coronavirus? Yeah, Paul, we have a sister church in Beijing. Uh, we're very close to um, the, the senior pastor there and I. We've exchanged staff. We've gone back and forth with uh, ministry to one another as well as with one another. Uh, in fact, his daughter currently is part of my staff. Um, so we're really I've close. Met her. Yeah, I met yeah, her. Yeah, I've yeah. I've met her in class. So. Yeah. That? Yeah, I've had her in class. yeah. 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 So, so early on, we were aware of what was going on in China because not only of her, but other fam friends we knew there. And Peter, her father, had called me up and said, hey, we're, we're not knowing what, where we're going to get any supplies. We can't get masks. We can't get gloves. We can't get thermometers. So we put a care package together and, and sent a whole lot of uh, equipment and, and, and materials and resources out to them. And uh, they're very helpful. In fact, they use those to be able to serve the community. And then when this started here, the other, about last week, right at the beginning of the week, I got about uh, just over 2,400 uh, masks that he mailed to us for our beginning of what we're going through. So we have really wonderful relationship with them. He told me this. He said, China will never be the same. The forced pause took the Chinese people out of their frenetic pace and their, their, their commitment to things that, that don't last and force them to rediscover family relationships in the solitude of their homes. The, the church was very active during this in caring for people. They risked their own health to provide those for those who were shut in. And people noticed, the communities noticed, uh, the government noticed. And as Peter said, we went from pariah to favored. And uh, my, one of my favorite stories is his wife, because some, some women that she knew in the church said, hey, we're pretty bored, let's do something, started a, 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 an online Zoom chat group. And uh, they were talking about everything from the Bible, God, and, uh, and makeup, uh, whatever, they, whatever they could do to just pass the time and enjoy one another. Well, it became wildly pop popular. She had to ask, uh, she had to add all these other ones. Now she does it like all day. She's doing these different ones so that enough people can participate. And most of the people that are participating aren't even believers. They are coming for the community that's being offered in this way. And uh, as Peter said, the church is growing. He said we're, we're uh, completely shut down in terms of our ability to be a location. And yet we're finding out that the church is never a location, it's a people. And, you know, as we were discussing uh, previously about the work there in China, uh, just how the pastor himself no doubt hit the pause button in his own mind, in his own spirit. What is it that the Lord wishes to do in this? The Lord's not taken aback. The Lord's not unaware of what's mm -hmm. occurring. How is God going to use this situation? And how can we work with God? How can God work through us is what I sense is that yeah. you know, even for us here, in the greater uh, Portland area, how do we hit the pause button? Not to pause in terms of connection with people, but okay, we can go into a panic or we can think, okay, Lord, what strategically do you wish to do right now in and through our lives? Um, God is not taken aback. God is not taken unaware. You see this throughout mm -hmm. scripture, the resilience, the strategic you know, rebounding that occurs by way of God's people. And I, I sense that from Pastor Peter there and what you and others are doing close to home inside the church and outside. Here we're speaking specifically about the work of the church in the greater Portland area and, and China. And uh, with that, um, <clears throat> you know, you have a background in the sciences, Mark. You have an engineering background. Uh, you know, I've, I've really been struck by the work Beaverton Foursquare Church does as it relates to, I think you provide a, a science day for uh, people when there is an in-service day at school. Uh, you work with the public schools where, you know, people that are connected to your church in some manner with Intel or other domains will come and do like a seminar on robotics. I remember talking to one of your 
uh, uh, parishioners who who does work in that domain and and a host of other spheres. So you yourself and others in your community are are people of faith and people who are rigorously engaged in sciences and have careers in the sciences. And you don't see this conflict between the two. It's so easy for us to have a conflict between faith and science when it comes even to matters like this global pandemic. Um, how would you encourage people to both trust in God, mm-hmm. look to the miraculous intervention of God, and also have good common sense in terms of science? Because it is a two-book orientation that you embrace, the book of scripture and the book of nature, that those aren't in conflict for God. God's the source, the author of both. How would you encourage people uh, to trust both God, trust in God, and also to, to listen well to what good scientists may be saying to them at this time, medical doctors and beyond? Yeah, you know, Paul, I, there's no conflict. I mean, God created this world. It's fallen. Um, God is not the author of fallenness. Fallenness is the state we're in right now. God is the author of restoration and redemption. Um, and he's doing that in the midst of this. Uh, but what, what's happening right now, we have to respect. Uh, medical professionals are doing everything they can to care for people. Uh, I mentioned to you, we're dropping off masks over, or I didn't, I guess I, yesterday, I'm, uh, we dropped off 1,600 masks at St. Vincent mm. Hospital uh, because of all the ones that were sent from China. They dropped off. I'm going to do that today. Um, we, uh, we take the science seriously. This is a deadly, contagious virus. And again, we have to respect it. We went online for that reason. We're only allowing a few staff to enter our building and we wear masks and gloves and disinfect the food we receive so that others won't become a point of transmission. Um, we have a, a no contact drop off for the food drive. Immediately, again, it goes into being disinfected. Uh, we have a no contact pickup for people to pick them up and we provide those people that are doing deliveries with gloves and masks right in the box. So. Um, we, we want to respect this world we live in and the reality of what, it, what we're all going through right now. Um, the intersection with the, that with our faith is demonstrated in our willingness. After all the precautions are taken, we're going to be out there where there's a need. Uh, I, we're compelled. We're called. This is who we are. Um, this, is, this is our Christian faith. And, uh, you know, people ask, well, uh, what is the answer? Well, the answer is Jesus. And, and I mean, seriously, Paul, the son left heaven to walk around this fallen mess, and he bore the pain of it. He had an invitation to the Father's table, but he entrusted he he, he has entrusted that invitation to us. And and this is the time not for us to cower or be in fear or to to um, not believe either, either in, in, that God could intervene. We want to believe and ask, and God does. One of the best ways He's intervening, though, is both through us and in us. Yeah. And I think about people like Dietrich Bonhoeffer or Jim Elliot. Um, with the sacrifices they made willingly. I think, I think we can put ourselves out there to fill the gaps. And the good news is a lot of the, the churches that I'm talking to and seeing and others uh, in our community, including the civic authorities and the school principal, uh, a man I, I, I love who I've worked with so much at Barnes, um, uh, we're working together. Uh, we understand that there's something big here that we have to respond to and we're responding to it. Mm. Uh, I was going to ask you about that, and I appreciated how you in, engaged it. That you know the reason why you're doing this is 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 Christ is um, the, the the fact that God came down from heaven to earth to identify with us in our brokenness, and so God is for us, God is with us, God is in us, and and God compels us, God calls us, God moves us in the midst of this new normal, as you often hear it said for this global pandemic of the coronavirus. There's also a sense in which there's a new normal for us in the faith community not to sit back and and to really take our faith seriously. The love of Christ compels us, Paul said. And and I sense that from what uh, you've shared. Any any further thoughts about what motivates you, what moves you as a theologian of the affections? Paul, I, I... The best thing I can say is that we have wonderful relationships with people we love, and we don't want to see anybody else um, have to go through this. I, I, expose, I, I expressed to you yesterday that um, one of the pastors on our staff, two, two of the pastors on our staff, um, tested positive for this virus. Uh, one of them is finally on the other side of it. The other one still seems to be going through it. His name is Pastor Kison. He leads our uh, Nepali fellowship, and he contracted it. 
and uh, a lot of us were around him. So I actually had to go into quarantine for a while. I had to be tested myself. Um, I had to figure out how to how to continue to do the food drive on a phone when other volunteers were there because I had to step back out of respect for the people I care about and love. Um, but when I, I don't want that to happen to anyone else. Pastor Keeson and his family are quarantined. His wife likely has it. They've got three children. Um, I don't know how we as believers who love the world that God has put around us, all the people, the interrelationships we have, the, the interdependence we have on one another can't uh, at this time be responding in, the, in whatever way we can uh, to love our community. And as you had said, too, you know, there's a need for wisdom and how one does that and uh, not to expose people further. I'm struck by a quote Luther, uh, you know, made a statement he uh, wrote um, back at a time when the church in Wittenberg, Wittenberg where he lived, was um, impacted horrifically um, by a, a plague and, you know, not to expose ourselves unduly. Um, to to take the precautions that are necessary, but also not to hold back out of fear. And if my neighbor needs me, I must respond. And uh, I just was really struck by that and what you you and others are doing and Pastor Kisung, as you have mentioned, who's continuing to face this challenge. We just pray, as we prayed earlier, um, we pray God's healing mercies on this dear pastor and, and, on, and on others who are struggling, because um, it is very scary, very, very matter, much a matter of something that we have to be alert to at every turn in this new normal. And yet also God's new normal comes into play, which is always God's norm to engage, not disengage. Yeah. So um, what are a few more of the challenges that you've come across? I mean, we're in the early days of this pandemic. It's probably not going to go away anytime soon, as, as we're told. It could be here for quite some time here in, in abroad. Um, but what are some of the, the stories that have really impacted you and maybe caused for sorrow? And then also some stories that have just served as great inspiration, even close to home or overseas, further to what you've said. Well, time. I, I don't know where all this extra time is that I'm supposed to have. This, is, this has not been a snow day. <laughs> I thought this was going to be six Saturdays and a Sunday, but I think I've spent more time every day, even when I was quarantined, because I was quarantined, that was a challenge to be here. And, and for the sake of all the people I care about, uh, I, I, I had to step back, uh, but I was just as engaged. And it's been a long and fruitful week since it started. And I'm not going to say I haven't um, been thankful for and grateful for the opportunity to work like we have. But uh, it, this is a, there's a lot of challenges. Right now, the biggest challenge is probably getting enough food to meet the need. Uh, people are afraid of exposure. So that's why we're taking such care to to disinfect, to have no contact zone so people can come by with a car, drop it up outside the building. We'll bring it inside. I mean, our people practically look like they're in hazmat suits at this point because we don't want to be carriers. We don't want to transmit anything. So we've got to treat everything just with real with real sense of, uh, of what's going on. We understand it. So um I guess, uh, and, and, and to that point, the challenge of having to be uh, quarantined, I was exposed to so many people after I was exposed. I was in a room, there were four of us in a room, Peter, Pastor Kisan was one of them, two days before he was symptomatic. Uh, understanding what they're saying about this, this flu, that meant he was already contagious. And we were in close quarters for, for quite a long meeting. And um, when he called me up a week later, because he didn't know until a week later, we knew he was sick. I, we didn't put the two together. We didn't really think it had gotten to Oregon at that level yet but he called me up and told me he had tested positive the first thing I, I had to I had to deal with was wow I I might be infectious I was around him and so were the other three people in, or the other two people in the room and so we self-quarantined we let the church know and now all the people who had been around me now are nervous not only that I have uh, two pregnant daughters I have uh, grandchildren come to my house every day that I've been with so the 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 sense of seriousness about what could be happening right then. Uh, that was, that was uh, definitely one of the bigger challenges. I, I called my doctor based upon my, my level of exposure. They determined it was best if I did get tested. So I went through one of the drive through test centers. And yesterday I got the news that I'm not, uh, um, that I'm not positive. I was negative. That's the first time I ever wanted to be the negative guy. Um, 
usually pretty positive, but I was glad to be negative. And a lot of people were relieved when they heard that because there were that many people. And um, we, are, we are now keeping it very small groups that serve together at the church for the food drive. And we're, not, we, we're keeping it the same people as, as much as we can so that we're not, if one group gets exposed, then we can quarantine them. But another group was not exposed can go in and continue to do, do the work. In addition to that, we're, 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 we're lights out for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday in case anything uh, got in. We're, we're going to let that settle out and, and be done. I understand it can't last that long. So that when we pick up the next week, anything that was there wouldn't be anymore. So it, there's a lot of challenges, but um, we rise to those challenges. I mean, I'm seeing this across the board. Other churches, we're having lots of conversations. I'm talking to other outreach pastors and, and senior pastors and, and really learning uh, how people are being creative in this. One of the things that uh, Eric Knox, you know Eric, uh, he runs Hala Mentor Ministries, called me up, they needed boxes, we had them, he came over, we gave them boxes to serve their families. We had another uh, woman from our, our congregation called up about a school uh, in her area that reached out and said, is there anything you can do? And we were able to give them boxes. We are fortunate still that food is coming in. And this, that's probably what inspires me most, Paul. You asked that question, what's inspiring? Um, the Chinese Christians who roasted the and went out and did what they needed to care for the poor, sick and elderly. I was very, very uh, moved by that. The generosity of the Chinese church in sending us masks. Uh, people calling and offering to volunteer to help one another. Uh, people that are coming and bringing food. I'm, I've always been impressed with the school district and Barnes and their willingness to have partnerships with the faith community. And they called us. They said, there's something we can't do that you can. There's just limits on, on how we are allowed to get food to people that you don't have. And we'd like to partner with you. Uh, those are the kinds of things that inspire me. I'm, I'm inspired by everyone who's taking it seriously, and I, I hope more people do. I, I hope that a lot of people still seem to think that this is, um, it's not important to be maintaining social distance. I see that at some parks and at some, uh, and at some of the stores I've gone to, uh, but a lot of people are, and it's going to take all of us. We're, at, we're in this together. Uh, we're just in it together. And in closing, you know, you just said we're all in this together. Uh, you hear it said that it's going to get far worse before things get better. Any closing thoughts for our viewers, um, our listeners, uh, to exhort, to encourage, to build up? What What would you have to say, Mark? Yeah, thanks, Paul. Um, I would say that health and wealth are worshipped in our culture, and right now neither is secure they're, they're, they've been our idols but they're not secure right now people are giving a forced sabbath in the immediate in the company of their immediate family and friends and they're asking what really matters uh we have the answer uh, part of that answer is the way that we're out there caring listening partnering uh we're there to, to try to be a solution and being out there i think has meant the world to certainly the families we get to feed because we know these families. We've been involved for years with these same families. We know them by name. And it's making a difference. And that's enough of a difference for us to continue to do what we're trying to do. Uh, again, we have the answer. It's in Christ. And it's our engagement as, as ambassadors of Christ that are going to make all the difference. So let's be generous with care, with resources, with prayer, and, of course, love. Because mm. love is lapped up everywhere it's spilled. Mm. I love that. Love is lapped up wherever it is spilled, and God's love is lavish. Uh, God pours mm -hmm. it out and wants to pour it out through us if we are willing vessels, responsive to God's initiative and God's promptings. And uh, you mentioned ambassadorship. What a great biblical theme. Paul was an ambassador in chains, as he <laughs> says in Ephesians, but that didn't keep God from working through Paul from a prison cell. And so in the midst of this new normal, God wants to break out, not as a virus, but um, as uh, a life-giving, personal, interpersonal force for good. And uh, thanks, Mark. Always enjoy talking with you. Pastor Mark Nicholas of Beaverton Foursquare Church, who serves as the local and global outreach pastor. Uh, we've been friends for years. And uh, Mark, just I love you, and I'm thankful for you. And I'm Paul Lewis Metzger, the director of New Wine, New Wineskins. Thank you for joining us for this episode of New Wine Tasting. Blessings to you all. Be safe.